Yeah. I'm Robert Lachos. I'm at California State University, San Bernardino. I'm in the Department of Health Science and Human Ecology. We have undergraduate programs in uh, undergraduate programs in public health and food and nutrition sciences, as well as human ecology. My training is as a developmental psychologist, and early on um, in my graduate work, about 15 years ago, I was very interested in the social development of children and adolescents how they get on with their peers, how they make friends, how they uh, get on bi-directionally with their, their parents. And um, as a graduate student, I was conducting a lot of research looking at attachment and personality and things like that. And I was very discouraged for one reason. I didn't feel like I was having an impact on um, the lives of individuals. So much of my work as a, a professor and academic has been looking at the health behaviors of children and adolescents. And so what I wanted to do today very quickly is talk about what we know about preventing drug use among adolescents. And hopefully today I'm going to be able to give you a very brief overview of adolescent drug use in the United States. I'll talk about what works in preventing adolescent drug use, as well as looking at um, some commonly used uh, primary prevention curricula and programs. Then I'll end by uh, asking the question, where should we go from here? If we look at data regarding uh, adolescent alcohol, tobacco, or other drug use, we see some interesting things. This is data that comes from the 2010 Prize Survey, which is a survey that's conducted every year among a random sample of adolescents in grades 6 through 12. The 2010 it had a little more uh, than 108,000 uh, students in it. There's a couple of interesting things we can take from this data. The first thing that we can see from this data is that alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use begins at a very early age, around sixth grade. So we can see that, that almost 7.5% of sixth graders have smoked an entire cigarette for the first time. Almost 15% of them have had an entire serving of alcohol and almost 8% of them have had used some type of illicit drug. The most commonly used drug would be marijuana. The second thing I think we can take away from this data is that there's a developmental trajectory for adolescent alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use. That is, as kids get older, they tend to use substances um, more frequently, and they tend to use uh, more substances. So, for example, by the end of 12th grade, we can see almost 42% of kids have smoked an entire cigarette. You can see almost 65% have had an entire serving of alcohol, and almost 36% of them have um, used some other type of illicit drug. Again, marijuana being the most commonly used drug among adolescents. If we look at more local data, this is data from uh, an area next to our university. Uh, Redlands is kind of a middle class, upper middle class uh, kind of, um, uh, town. Uh, it's around uh, 80,000 uh, people. Um, it's something like one out of five uh, individuals that live in Redlands have a bachelor's degree or higher. I tell my students Redlands is where it's famous for oranges and, and money. Um, it's kind of like Pasadena, but many more orange uh, groves. But what we can see here, even in this population, is that a large percentage of kids in grades 7, 9, and 11 are using alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. But we have 63% of the kids in grade 11 that had an entire serving of alcohol, and almost 30% of them have used marijuana at some point in life. This is a relatively affluent area in, in um, Southern California. I also took the data from the California Healthy Kids Survey looking at, at uh, LUSD, and we can see that those same rate are a little bit higher than marijuana and, and alcohol use, particularly among the 11th graders. So one of the reasons why I showed so this both national and local data is oftentimes we think about alcohol, tobacco, and the drug use occurring among those students that live in urban areas or those students that live in suburban areas or even um, those students who live in, let's say, uh, much more uh, non-urban areas. But we see that alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use um, is common among uh, teenagers. And as the speakers have said before, most of these kids are not going to become dependent or addicted. Addictive alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. 
but there are short-term effects with alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use. One of those effects are the effects of alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use on academic achievement. And with the No Child Left Behind Act, we see that there's a greater emphasis on reaching educational outcomes. And this data comes from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, showing the relationship between the frequency of alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use, and how well kids do in school. And what you can see here is that the relationship is such where the more uh, kids that use, or the, or the more often that they engage in that behavior, the more likely they are, are not to achieve academically. Where you have kids that are currently using marijuana, they're getting mostly D's and S. The kids that are doing well in school, they're less likely um, to use alcohol, tobacco, and uh, other drugs. Now, now, one of the things that we don't know is, is whether or not using alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs is causing kids to perform worse academically, or is the, the fact that kids that aren't doing well academically turn to alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs? Because the research that I've been doing and looking at parental influence on adolescent drug use, we ask a, a, a very unique question. One of the questions we ask uh, both middle school students and high school students in my research is, if you're not currently using alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, why would you use alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs? And the number one reason that we receive from both middle school and high school students alike is to make friends and form a peer group. Now, they don't come to me and say, well, I want to form a peer group. That's something a psychologist would say. But they say, hey, I want to fit in, and I want to be one of the girls, so on and so forth. That's, that's the number one reason. And if you don't remember anything else from my talk today, I want you to remember this is that alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use among adolescents is primarily a social interaction. And the number one developmental need of teenagers is to make friends and form a peer group. So oftentimes kids are going to choose to use alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs simply so that they can achieve that fundamental developmental task that we all needed to achieve at that age. We've been doing alcohol, tobacco, and other drug prevention in the United States um, for years. You know, it started, I think, with the Prohibition Act in 1919, and then we see more systematic interventions done uh, with alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs in the 1960s and 1970s. In 2001, Congress passed the Safe and Drug Free Schools Act, which requires uh, schools to do uh, drug prevention, tobacco prevention, as well as violent prevention. Interestingly, though, in that particular act, it doesn't say anything about the qualitative nature of those prevention efforts. And because of the Safe and Drug Free Schools Act, we see a proliferation of school-based ATOD programs, as well as community-based alcohol, tobacco, and other drug prevention uh, programs. But the majority of these programs have not been successful. In fact, if we look at um, much of the literature regarding preventing adolescent tobacco and, and, and drug use, we see that most of the programs, around 95% of them, do not um, reduce drug use, do not keep kids from using drugs. And there's a number of reasons why this might be occurring. Um, many times we're going to come to find out that the theoretical basis for the program program is not occurring. In other cases, they're not um, good fidelity to the curricular component. Another reason I think that we haven't done a good job in terms of alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use prevention in, in schools is simply because there's not an agreement on what effectiveness means. That is, there's not an agreement in our society about what it means to have an effective drug prevention program. In some cases, people will say, well, we're effective if we offer the the curriculum. So if a thousand kids participate in the curriculum at this particular school district, then we've done our job. In other cases, um, have we kept kids from using drugs, or have we reduced the frequency of alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use among uh, teenagers? That being the case, we do know some things about effective alcohol, tobacco, and other drug prevention. So what I'm going to talk about next is what works and what doesn't work in preventing uh, alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use among teenagers. So first, let me give you the bad news. Um, this is what we know from about 20 years of research of what doesn't work in preventing alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Uh, we've 
have a very good knowledge base to tell us that information only programs, that is programs that teach kids about the negative effects of alcohol or how tobacco affects the brain and the cardiovascular system or how a drugs can be addictive don't work. That is increasing kids knowledge or awareness about the dangers of drugs not effective. And, and this kind of makes really, really good sense to most rational people that increasing an individual's knowledge about how the body works with dangers of drugs doesn't affect our health behavior. So show of hands, how many of you today um, drove over 60 miles an hour on the freeway? Well, don't you know you shouldn't drive fast? In fact, aren't there uh, signs about every three miles that tell you how fast you should drive? How many of you last three days have used your cell phone or text while you're driving? Come on now, I'm a psychologist, I'll tell if you lie. Well, don't you know you shouldn't do that? How many of you have uh, drank alcohol in the last week? No, I don't want to know that. Um, but we know from <laughs> we we know from decades of research that simply increasing student knowledge regarding the dangers of drug is not an effective approach. Um, but this is the most commonly used approach in the United States today. I have three dollars in my pocket right now. I challenge anybody to find a kid, even a kindergarten kid, that doesn't know that smoking is bad for them. Most kids know how these drugs affect their body, but that's not what affects their behavior because alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use is primarily a social interaction. Another approach we have are those programs that try to change kids' affect, how they uh, feel about things or, or their, their emotions, particularly those programs that focus on self-esteem. And these approaches were very, very popular in the late 1980s and 1990s, that if we made kids feel uh, bad, uh, good about themselves, that they'd be less likely to use alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. And I re remember studying self-esteem programs during graduate school. And one of the things that I thought of in, in terms of when this proliferation of, of feel-good or self-esteem programs was occurring was, well, do we have a epidemic of kids who feel bad about themselves? And when we look at the data, we find out, no, that self-esteem takes a very predictable development course. It's fairly high in elementary school. It goes down in middle school, particularly for girls, and it goes back up in high school. And when we look at all the research regarding the role of self-esteem and alcohol, tobacco, and the drug use, is we see that it's not predictive in any way, shape, or form of whether or not kids will use alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. Another approach we know that doesn't work are scare tactics. So trying to scare kids into not using alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. And my daughter, who was in, was a last year a freshman in high school and in what I call a very inept health education class, the nurse came in, showed them black lungs, and said, don't smoke because this is what will happen to your lungs. And then the nurse said, any questions? Okay, now don't go out and smoke. And thought that was going to be an effective prevention approach. In fact, we know some of the most uh, famous uh, scare tactic approaches aren't working. In fact, there was a program called Scared Straight that was conducted in the late 1970s where they brought these, these kids. And if you watch the video, you know, they come in in the whole 70s garb. They have the butterfly collar and they have the bell bottom jeans. And they bring the kids into the prison and prisoners start yelling at them like, if I ever see you in here for drug use, you know, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to take you for a pack of cigarettes. These kids were visibly shaken. What was interesting, about eight years ago, a sociologist followed up on on those original 13 kids and found that every one of them was either in prison or dead. Every one of them. But we still think these approaches are effective because for, for adults that have an achieved sense of identity, that have uh, critical thinking skills, you would say, oh my gosh, you know, that's an effective approach. It doesn't work for, for teenagers at all. Another approach is a very popular approach particularly here in the United States or have assemblies where you bring in what I call these edutainers where they juggle or do magic or have birds talk and they say you know don't you know take drugs don't drink alcohol don't kiss boys you know things like that um, those approaches don't work but this is one of the biggest expenses um, outside of uh, field trips that schools uh, spend their money on and there's no evidence to suggest that these short short term assembly approaches are effective so what does work well, one approach that we know works is if you give kids 
the skills that they need when they encounter situations that can lead to alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use. So we need to teach kids resistance skills. Uh, we need to teach kids how to make decisions and how to uh, communicate assertively. And we also need to give kids uh, um, the time in class to practice these skills so that they build up the confidence to use these skills in their everyday life. In, in, in good drug prevention and education, I want kids to be able to step off the bus when their friend says, hey, let's go down the wash and smoke a cigarette. For that sixth grader to look their friend in the eye and they can say, you know, Susie, I enjoy spending time with you, um, but smoking is a problem for me right now because I have a track meet in the morning. Hey, let's go to my house and play Nintendo. We call those the five usual skill steps. We also need to promote protective factors, parent-child communication, being involved in after-school activities, trying to find something that, that kids are crazy about. In my research, one of the best protective factors we've found is if kids have something that they're crazy about, whether it's a sport or it's a, a club or some other activity. If kids have their own little lemonade stand, you know, like little kids, like my year old at summertime, she has her lemonade. I'm an eighth, and she's 35 cents a day, and I spend $50 a day on this. But she's crazy about it. And if it costs me $5,000 and teach her crazy about that, I'm going to let her do that because she'll be less likely to use alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. We need to use interactive te teaching strategies. Our kids are up out of their seats, they're practicing particular skills. And we also need to have kids examine the role of media and also the role that social norms, or at least perceived social norms, what kids think everybody's doing and how that affects their behavior. So what approaches have been used uh, based on what we know, what works and what doesn't work? Well, one, one of is the D.A.R.E. program. How many of you have heard of the D.A.R.E. program? This is the most popular, most commonly used program in the United States. It's developed by um, the Los Angeles Police Department. The police go into the, the school, schools, elementary schools, and teach kids about uh, the dangers of drugs. And what we find the program is that it doesn't work. There are over 300 studies on the D.A.R.E. program, and, and most of the rigorous studies show that it doesn't work. Now, if you go to the website for the D.A.R.E. folks who market and sell this program, they'll say, it does work. We have scientific proof from a randomized control trial that kids that go through the D.A.R.E. program are more likely to approach a police officer when they need help than kids who don't go through the D.A.R.E. program. Well, what about drug use? What about smoking? Well, it has no effects, but they're more likely to approach a police officer. Let's change it from the D.A.R.E. program to, you know, find a cop program, if that's what's important for our society. In fact, even after 10 years, uh, you look at long-term uh, longitudinal use rates, you find out the kids that went through the D.A.R.E. program are no different than, than controls 10 years later. However, uh, one effective program that was developed um, by RAND is called Project Alert, and this does focus on um, social and uh, other types of resistance skills. And you can see that whether it's cigarettes or marijuana or alcohol use, uh, kids that go through Project Alert are uh, much less likely to use drugs. In a very effective program called Life Skills Training, which is developed uh, by Gilbert Botvin out of Cornell University, showing direct um, effect on alcohol, tobacco, uh, marijuana, and polydrug use as well as methamphetamine. Um, the LST program it does not talk about the dangers of alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs. I think there may be 15 minutes out of this 12-hour lesson that, it, that addresses those types uh, of issues. So that's all I did having practicing um, uh, social skills and the like. Now, NIDA have given us a number of principles for effective uh, drug prevention programs. And these are all questions that we should be asking when we're choosing to use any type of drug prevention program. So we want to be able to answer these questions when we're selecting a program to implement. These are available at the conference uh, website. So where should we go from here? Well, all of us need to advocate for effective drug prevention program and do as much as we can to keep those ineffective approaches out of schools and community programs. One of the things that we know from my research is that implementing the program as it's written and having good fidelity to the program components is crucial. We also know that um, as researchers, 
we need to disseminate information on what works. And we haven't done a very good job at this. At this. As researchers, we haven't done a good job of, of working with educators and community members and policymakers in terms of, of what works. We also need to focus on programs that not only teach kids resistance skills, but also promote protective factors. And, and, and also focus on other factors besides just primary prevention um, programs, including family and, and community level type programs. In fact, recent research from uh, uh, my DIDARP funded study showed that parental monitoring is the best predictor of whether or not kids use drugs. If, if parents are involved in the kid's life, they know where their child goes, they know what their child does, that child's uh, less likely to, to use drugs. And then finally, you need to be a change agent. And I challenge you all to share what you've heard today at this conference with somebody. Um, tweet it, Facebook it, go outside and yell it, throw up a smoke signal, do whatever you need to do. Disseminate this information. That's the only way that we're going to make a change. Thank you. Great talk, great, uh, great talk Robert. It was very uh, fascinating and uh, the charge to do something better. Do we have and all the slides are available at the conference website as well. Or you can email me, I'll send it to you. I think the, the, the point that you made about affection is very important. And uh, I'm curious as to what, what, how do you uh, operationalize that? What is that? Do you know what to have? Even that the other drugs in fact are wrong, they're dangerous. Is there anything you want to do to shoot from the zero? No one ever signed up, or is it more reasonable to perhaps delay the, the age of which uh, the experiment goes to come? That's one question. The question is, you know, what can we reasonably expect from an alcohol, tobacco, and other prevention program, uh, other drug prevention program in terms of impact or effectiveness? And I think it's reasonable um, with the millions of dollars that the federal government spends, as well as community-based money, to expect that we can delay initiation of alcohol, alcohol tobacco, as well as decrease the frequency of, of that as well, um, from a primary prevention standpoint. I we one more question. Yeah. I was actually uh, interested in some of our plans. There are certainly an initiative with a few a few years that has been focusing primarily on basically educating our lessons about a group um, very intense and the type of speech out there and to multimedia as far as educational knowledge. And it seems to be gaining um, traction across all of the things that from the peer presentation you've just seen that that probably won't, won't be as effective maybe as you know all of the things that you're saying to that. Yeah, the, the, the question, the, the comment was, you know, we have kind of multimedia approaches or maybe even online approaches. We all have new technology. And with new technology, we think, oh my gosh, this new kind of a wow thing. It's new to us. And then we say, oh my God, that's got to be effective. And I don't think that's going to be effective. I think we need to give kids the skills that they need to encounter when they encounter risk situations and then give them an the opportunity to practice those skills. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah.